welcome everyone here this afternoon, uh, both students and visitors alike. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Uh, dean John Vile and I welcome you here today. Uh, we have an exciting interdisciplinary series this semester on letters, and we have, I think, a very dynamic and exciting speaker today who will talk to us about the kind of communication that I have discovered is the dominant mode of communication for just about everyone in this class. When we had the reflection at the beginning of the course, I asked you what your primary means of communication was, and then what communication style you would like to work on in your personal and professional life. And overwhelmingly, the responses indicated that you use texting to communicate with each other, the fastest, most direct, easy way to communicate with each other. So our presentation today is going to be talking about uh, the digital spaces in which we communicate. Dr. Kate Pantelides is Assistant Professor of Rhetoric and Composition in the Department of English here at MTSU. She earned her bachelor's degree at Bowdoin College, her master's at the University of Louisville, and her PhD at the University of South Florida. She's taught rhetoric, composition, and technical communication courses at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Her research interests include rhetor rhetorical genre studies, discourse analysis, computer-mediated communication, writing program administration, and the experience of parents in academe. A prolific scholar, her work has been published in College Composition and Communication, Composition Studies, Computers and Composition, an international journal, Composition Forum, and Review of Communication, among other places. She's probably published in many other, many other journals, and she has other exciting projects in the works. Her topic today is Words in the Clouds, How We Talk to Each Other in Digital Spaces. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be part of this lecture series. Um, I think talking about letters is fascinating, and particularly that you've gotten the opportunity um, to look at such different kinds of letters. So um, without further ado, Let's do that. All right, so um, I'm gonna start by telling you some stories about writing these days. And uh, they might be some stories you've heard. Um, first of all, that we never do it. We never write anymore. Um, our writing is riddled with errors. It's superfluous. It's lost that je ne sais quoi, the mystery, the romance, the seriousness, seriousness that we used to have. Um, and that with all of this technology, our heads are just in the clouds. So um, I don't know if you can tell by the tone of my voice, but I don't believe these stories. Um, and I've done a lot of research that demonstrates that these stories are not true. We have some really useful empirical evidence that suggests that we're writing more than we ever have, um, that we're making a lot of mistakes, but not more mistakes than we've made in the past. They're just different mistakes. Um, and that there are some real uses to the various spaces in which we write these days. Um, so today I'd like to focus on how we write letters, but I want to expand our understanding of where we write letters because we have so many opportunities um, to write letters in digital space. And they can be for many different um, opportunities, for many reasons. Um, there's a lot of really different kind of audiences that we're writing to now. And I wanna look at that. Um, certainly uh, the epistolary writing tradition, and that's probably what we're most familiar with when we're thinking about what it means to write a letter to someone, where you take um, a piece of paper, you write a letter by hand, and you write it to one person. Um, I wanna complicate our understanding of that epistolary tradition as between two people, because what I'm gonna invite you to look at, at, at today um, are a number of really different kinds of letter archives. So first, one that comes from the epistolary tradition, and then a few digital archives. So, We'll just look at different kinds of letters and complicate our understanding of the rhetorical situation in which those letters are written. And by rhetorical situation, I just mean um, the context in which those letters are written. So who they're written to, who is writing them, and what that means in effect. Um, one more preface. Um, so when I'm talking about the clouds today, I'm talking about that in a conceptual way. So I'm not talking specifically about cloud storage, but just this idea that when we write in the clouds, 
there isn't a tangible artifact, right? We're, we don't have that piece of paper. Um, so that it kind of just exists in, in cloud space, okay? So that's the, the understanding of cloud that I hope that we'll get the, sense, the chance to work with today. All right, so I've told you all some stories about writing, and I'm gonna invite you to tell me some stories too, okay? So I'm gonna ask you if you have a computer open, fantastic, or if you have um, a phone, um, to go to menti.com and enter code 172590. And then um, I'm just gonna ask you to tell me your stories writing letters, your experiences writing letters. So what are your stories about writing? Do you write letters? To whom? And what platform? So again, remember I'm asking for the sort of broader understanding of letter writing. So maybe it's a text that you send to somebody, maybe it's a letter you write in social media, maybe it's an email to a friend or professor. And I'll see what y'all have written. If this works, let's see. Okay, good, it's working. We're writing letters, but is anybody gonna get to read them? Okay, so I'm starting to write letters as traditionally as possible with a wax seal and everything just for fun. I love that, that's great. I write letters to my professors in the form of emails. Absolutely, that's 100% a letter. I send a lot of emails for academic purposes and mainly text for social purposes. I also occasionally write some handwritten notes for my girlfriend, great. So I really like how you're already demonstrating that you write in different platforms for different people for different reasons, given um, the, the affordances of different media. I write to people using email dozens of times a day. Ditto, me too. Um, I write as an outlet um, for my emotions and how I feel about my situation. That's great. So I think some people are invoking just this sort of no, this broader notion of writing. Um, I once wrote letters back and forth when I was younger and now do a lot of emails for various purposes. So I think a lot of people have like a tradition of writing um, that sometimes changes and evolves as their experiences do. I used to have pen pals that I had met online. One was from Finland and one was from Georgia. And we sent letters back and forth for years. That's great. Um, hopefully you still, still do that or maybe you'll go home today and be inspired by thinking about writing letters and write them in another one. The majority of letters I write are emails, although on special occasions I write handwritten letters to my girlfriend. Um, so again, we, we're invoking this sort of um, intimate notion of a handwritten letter, that it's something you do for someone that you care about. Um, I'm used to writing formal letters of invitation for events, but otherwise not often. I still write, a, write letters to my more intimate friends and significant others. As a musician, I feel that your life is oftentimes an open letter that you post to social media for fans and followers. Yeah, that's a really nice way of thinking about that. I used to write letters a lot just a few years ago. I had a very close uncle of mine who lived in another state and we would communicate through letters. I also write letters to myself and God. Excellent. Um, all right, I'm just gonna read a couple more. Um, I wrote emails to my friend in Arizona before either of us got phones to communicate. I email most of my professional messages for work and professors. I write to my, make my dreams and goals tangible. The biggest example of letter writing I have experienced aside from email is I wrote over 25 freehand open when letters for by now, um, for my now fiance, the first year of our relationship. Very romantic. Um, all right, so I would love to continue hearing about your, um, your, your letters, but I'll, I'll leave this open so everybody can see for a moment. Um, but again, just in about two minutes, we've seen that you all have very extensive experiences with letter writing. And when we drill down on them, we understand that you already have very nuanced ideas of audience, um, of context, and appropriate venues for different, um, for different kinds of letter writing. All right, let's read one last one. I used to write paper letters when I was younger, but now I write to people using text and emails every day. I sometimes still write physical letters for more pers personal and meaningful communication. Great. So um, I think this clearly demonstrates, and I'll go back to my slides, um, that you all write, are writing but you are thinking about the writing that you do in digital space in a different way. I'm gonna suggest uh, that the writing that we, can, that we do in digital space can still have, can be really meaningful, that it doesn't have to just be um, this sort of casual um, conversation that we often suggest that it is. And I'm gonna offer us a perspective at looking at an archive of letters that hopefully will demonstrate that a little bit more effectively. So, 
my dramatic music and dramatic clouds to suggest that I think there's still drama and intrigue and interest when we write in, um, in the clouds. Okay. Um, and just to suggest, um, I'll tell you kind of what the, my setup today is. Um, I'm gonna start with looking at two theoretical understandings of clouds that I think are useful for understanding how we're interacting in digital space. And then I'm gonna show you some really different kinds of digital archives of letters, okay? So first, the theories. Okay, so um, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson wrote a really interesting um, book in 1980. So this is an old book now, but it's still really impactful for how we think about communication and particularly when we're talking about digital space. So the book that they wrote is Metaphors We Live By. And their thesis is that metaphors, um, and someone remind us, what, what's a metaphor? Um, so a simile is, uh, so it's a, it's a comparison, absolutely. Um, so a conceptual metaphor though, um, which is what they're really interested in, is um, it's a master, uh, metaphors are a master trope, but conceptual metaphors um, are ones that sh not just shape our communication, um, but they suggest it also shapes the way we think and act. And that's the piece that was really revolutionary when they wrote this book. Um, that we're not just using metaphors to help us understand our lives, but actually those metaphors impact the decisions we make in our lives. Um, and they make um, difficult ideas intelligible to our audience. Um, they posit that when we consider these metaphors and examine our talk in letters, it tells us something about how we see ourselves and how we <coughs> see our communities. Also how we value those things. All right, so I'm gonna give you some examples. So when we say this common thing, how did you spend your time? That is using a, a metaphor that time is money. And there's a lot of time is money metaphors that we use in our everyday life, right? We talk about wasting our time, um, but certainly that spending your time is a really, really clear one. Um, also, how are you doing today? I'm feeling kind of down or I'm in high spirits. I don't know if everybody says I'm in high spirits, but it's something that you read um, more, more often. Um, and that metaphor is just that emotions are spatial. We're at the end of the road, or I'm unsure where to go with this. We might talk about that if we're writing a paper or working on a project. So that, again, that's this journey metaphor that we use in all kinds of things, but particularly in our lives. We're at a crossroads, or we've come a long way, or we're on the rocks. Um, this is this uh, metaphor, again, of relationships being a journey. Um, we hear this all the time um, in uh, the ways that people talk about um, the relationships that they're in. And then um, this notion of people being sort of temperate, like I'm still warming up to this person, or this person is cold, this person is warm. Um, we use this frequently, too. And so um, we could spend hours and hours talking about this, but hopefully you're already recognizing that you use some of these metaphors. And again, they impact the way that we interact with folks. Um, the metaphor of battle is something that we use frequently in argumentation. Um, when you make, um, you make strong claims or somebody, um, uh, somebody notices the weak points in your argument. Um, so it's, it's kind of everywhere. So if you start thinking about it, I promise once you go home today, you'll start, you'll start noticing the, these metaphors. All right, um, so continuing this, the second theoretical piece that I wanna suggest um, extends, uh, this is a more recent theorist, and um, this is John Dern Peters. He wrote this book called The Marvelous Clouds, and he's a media scholar, and he's extended um, Lakoff and Johnson's understandings of metaphor in a way um, that is really, uh, Pretty, pretty revolutionary. He suggests um, that at some level, expression and existence merge. He argues that, like Lakoff and Johnson's understanding of how metaphors not only reflect our understandings, but also constitute and, under and organize our understandings of interaction. He says that media are not only carrier carriers of symbolic freight, but also crafters of existence. Like metaphors, media are not only about the world, they are the world. So very dramatic. So what does this all mean, okay? Um, what does it mean if we actually think that the metaphors that we live by are structuring our existence? That this understanding of um, the way that we talk in metaphors, that, that actually 
actually impacts the way that we interact and the way that we think of ourselves. Um, so letters offer an intimacy that sometimes starts to feel fleeting in digital space, and I think that's um, certainly re representative of what you all said about the kinds of letters that you write when you choose to handwrite something or when you choose to send an email or a text message. Um, one of the biggest differences is addressivity. And addressivity is just to whom you're addressing the work you're writing. So when you sit down to write a letter, you are addressing usually just the one person. But when you are um, writing in digital space, sometimes you don't know who you're speaking to. And that makes it really complex. Um, I'm going to talk about email listservs um, when we move to digital space. Um, and in these, in these spaces in particular, and this is pretty much true of most digital space opportunities, um, that maybe you're writing for a particular audience, but somebody else may be reading. Somebody else may be lurking or just kind of listening. And that really changes the potential interaction that you can have as a result of your letters. All right, so, um, but before we look at some digital letters, I want to look at some handwritten letters that I've been working with recently. Okay, and I don't know if you can read these very well, but I'll read them to you. But I want to describe where they're from. So um, uh, I want to put these ideas into practice um, because I have had the opportunity to work with a really interesting archive recently. Um, this archive was gifted to the MTSU English department. And they're letters written by elementary school children to a Holocaust survivor. Um, she survived the Holocaust, and she promised to her friends um, during the Holocaust that whomever, whoever lived and, um, and was able to tell their story, that they would. And so she ultimately moved to the US. She moved to Tennessee. And she spent her entire life going to elementary schools and telling kids um, the stories of the Holocaust. And um, so this. This archive um, was kind of given to a number of museums, and many of her, um, her papers are in Holocaust museums. But this particular piece, nobody quite knew what to do with. And thus, it was gifted to the MTSU um, English department. And so I've been looking at these um, letters with my students, and we've been doing analysis. Um, so I'm going to read you this first one, and I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts, right? If you all are going to do some analysis similarly, what, what might be some things that you pay attention to? So this was written in 1980, um, and I've taken off um, names. Dear Mrs. Marks, I found most, most hard to believe that that, um, that could happen in the 20th century. I don't think it is right for them to think that if they can take over one country, they can take over them all. I'm glad you came to talk to us. I hope they never take over us. Thank you for coming to talk to us. It was very interesting, and it was very nice of you to let us take that much of your time. I enjoyed it. I think everybody did, too. Um, sorry it happened to your family. OK, so what do you all think? Just this one letter. Any impressions? It's intense. It's interesting that she didn't really say anything like personally about the fact that the girl was the person spoke was in the Holocaust. She kind of just talked about, like, Taking over the country, and then P.S. Sorry that it happened in your family. Yeah. Kid, but. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. And never mention the Holocaust. Yeah. She focused on how it could affect her personally, because one of the things she said is, I hope they never take over us. Yeah. So she was focused on more of herself than the person who came in and told her story. Mm -hmm. Very, very thoughtful. Yes. It's really prescient, only because you know we're starting to have these issues of uh, far right uh, the Nazi sentiment becoming at the center of, uh, coming back to the center of conversation, uh, at least in America anyway, and in other parts of the world, you know, New Zealand just the other day, just mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, I am that long, maybe I think a week it's ago, last week, yeah. last week or so, you know, we had that, you know, that, uh, that uh, right wing attack. So, I mean, I think it's really pressing. And, uh, you said, yeah, it's from 1980, so mm -hmm. very pressing, and very shocking. I think. Yeah, I mean, so again, remember, these are elementary school children. so. A lot of what we're seeing is sort of how they're wrestling with these ideas. Yes? I think um, given the fact that it was written by an elementary sword, there, I, I feel like this child had processed it as best as you could expect someone at that age to. And I think it shows a level of maturity for someone who's between the ages of 8 and 10, mm -hmm. as far as understanding that it was a sort of a thing that, you know, in, in the mind of a, a child like that, 
saying, oh, I, re I really hope that doesn't happen to us, and I'm really sorry that that happened to you, I mean, but they, they understood the hardship, they just don't know how to express it as eloquently as we would expect a response to that subject to be expressed as that. Mm -hmm. so. And, and certainly developmentally, we might, and I do not pretend to be a developmental psychologist, but we might expect this experience, like thinking first, how would this impact me? And then we get the PS, oh, and I'm also thinking about other people because I know that's what happens developmentally. I'm starting to think of others, not just myself. Um, in the back and then right up here. I think there's a bit of evidence of disassociation there with how they said, you know, I hope they don't do this to us not at all kind of self-aware thinking about where might we be doing this whether or not that was being spoken by this woman who went and visited and spoke mm -hmm. but as we know in our country this is this is happening this is a growing movement um and you know people people always find a voice for saying bigoted things that created a situation like the holocaust um but you know this child as a child, you know, considering their maturity and maybe not being able to imagine that, oh, the world they live in could look like that. They're just imagining some sort of alien, some sort of foreign entity coming and oppressing them instead of wondering where might oppression already exist. Right, so this disconnect and not, and so going back um, a little bit to this uh, earlier comment about um, sort of seeing difference um, outside of themselves. Very interesting. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting looking at the sentence, um, saying it was very nice of you to let us take that much of your time. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that, um, to me, from a child's perspective, kind of conveys as much um, kind of emotional connection as they may have had. If they could tell, especially, I mean, obviously, we don't know how this person was communicating their story, but if they were appearing to be very emotional about it, that that was kind of what this child picked up on. I thought that was really interesting. And that's a really nice connection to this whole idea of how you spend your time, right? That we give our time to folks, that that's our resource. So again, returning to this metaphor of what's valuable. So if you were gonna do some really close analysis of this, you could go into that idea of thinking about spending time. That's a nice connection. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a few just quickly. And I'm, I'm gonna ask you the same question after we've looked at a number of letters, all right? And again, because they're hard to read, I'm gonna read them out loud. Um, Dear Mrs. Marks, Thank you for visiting our school to speak with us about the Holocaust. I thought it was neat to hear about the war from a real Holocaust survivor. I thought it was sad how the Nazi soldiers killed the girl who offered them a flower. I'm of German descent. My grandmother was German. Her parents were born in Germany. I appreciate your visit to talk with us. I enjoy hearing you speak. I wish we could talk about all of them because they're so interesting. Um, this letter was written in 1988. Dear Mrs. Marks, I thank you for coming to our school. Since your visit, everyone is getting books on the Holocaust. I would like to tell you something I found out when I told my mother you were coming to our school. My mother told me my father was pure German. Not knowing if he supported this time in history, he told me no, and I was glad to hear that. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, dear Mrs. Marks, the lecture you gave us was thoroughly enlightening. The experiences you told have helped me to further comprehend a time that only the survivors can speak of with any full knowledge. Your suffrage has helped me to see that barbar um, barbarianism has not left human nature and won't for generations to come. I can see the burden that everyone should carry so that this mass genocide does not, does not occur again. I can't help but think if I'd only been born 40 years earlier, how I would re react to a totalitarian, totalitarian dictator who wanted to rule the world. Would I submit or rebel, live or die, help or hinder? I will only know if another world war occurs, but World War III will leave um, the earth a burning waste. Um, I can't read the bottom there, so. I hope, um, yeah, this is your, your late afternoon reading. I hope you continue your talks for years to come. Yes. Um, dear Mrs. Marks, here's a different one. That really was cool. Some of that stuff is really sad. You are really nice. I'm, um, I'm, I think it's I'm glad. I'm glad I wasn't there. Happy holidays. Dear Mrs. Marks, and this was interesting. This whole class, all the boys had um, sports paper, and all the girls had ice cream paper. Um, so that's interesting, too. Um, written in 96. Dear Mrs. Marks, thank you for teaching us about your experience in the Holocaust. We all admire your bravery because some stuff you did I would have never done in that situation. I also want to thank you for taking your time to come into our class and handing us a bunch of information. Your sixth grade pal. 
Um, this one is from 1968. And this is, again, it's a, a really significant archive that spans multiple decades. Um, to Mrs. Marx, we are very glad you spent some time talking to us about communism and fascism and the concentration camps. We really enjoyed it. We thought it was very good. Some of the fourth graders were playing it on the playground. Germany sounds like kind of an exciting place. After what you said about Thanksgiving yesterday, I'm going to eat everything on my plate. So now um, we, we, don't, we can't read 1,500 letters, right? Um, but now that you've read a little, a small piece of the archive, what I'm going to ask you to think about, I'm going to ask for just a couple more comments. Um, do you start to see some patterns developing? Are there some things that you note um, that are sort of trends here, or some things that are particularly um, marked, that they stand out, that they deviate from the trends that you're noticing? Yes? It seemed like there was a very stark divide between the children who seemed to understand the gravity of the situation to be like this was a terrible thing and then ones who are like oh you know we're playing this out on the playground um who you know only sort of saw the application of i want to eat everything on my plate to not waste it mm -hmm. um and i don't know if that speaks of the age or the maturity of the children right or just them trying to figure out how do i put this information into my worldview yeah but there's certainly that great divide between those who kind of reached out as if this was you know telling your grandma happy christmas and those who were saying i am so sorry for what happened to you i i feel some sort of empathy for what that must have been like right so yeah i think that's a really nice division that you're noting so those who are kind of um, demonstrating empathy and those who are thinking more specifically about the impact on themselves. And certainly, I haven't given you all the information, right? Um, it would be helpful to know how old every single um, person is, and we don't have all of that. Sometimes we do, not all, all the time in the archive. Um, um, and, and there's only so much we know because this is a pretty one-sided archive. Only, we only have these letters, so we can look at Marx and recreate her life and her understanding, um, but we get a really, I think, a really fascinating view of her um, looking from this perspective. Okay, I think, yes? I noticed a tendency to sort of associate um, being German with a sort of inherited guilt. Yeah. And the kids who thought there were German people in their family, that they were German, needed to kind of absolve themselves of that by going through their own family history. Absolutely, and that's something um, in this research, again, this is a project in, in progress, um, something that comes up quite a bit. A lot of students talking about um, German heritage and, and sort of negotiating that. Yeah, it's really fascinating. All right, um, so last question about this before we look at a digital archive, very different set of letters. Um, if you were looking at this entire archive, would there be some certain things you'd be looking for? Some patterns that you'd be um, thinking you might see based on this small sample? Just sort of a prediction, something that you think you might find. Any predictions? Well, it's hard to predict, but one of the things that you can do as you start to look at these archives is get a sense of, um, you start to see how trends aggregate. So only looking at seven letters, you may not see those trends necessarily. But the more you see, the more you get a sense of um, what is conventional and what is deviating and what is really worthy of notice. Um, so whereas these letters were originally written to one person, and maybe they were also a, a bit of a performance potentially for an instructor, right, because they probably had to write these letters. Um, and you might make some guesses as to, um, there, there's some things in the letters that suggest to you that they're written in a particular way because an instructor asked them to write it that way. Um, but now, I'm reading these letters, my students are working with these letters, you all are reading these letters, and they've taken on a very, very different meaning because they're in this archive. So what I'm gonna invite you to think about is this relationship between the individual artifact and the larger archive itself. And what I'm gonna try to ask you to do is tack back and forth between these two views and that's my suggestion today, my thesis, is that we have to con con, um, continually tack back and forth between this notion of the individual and the collective. And when we have those multiple perspectives, we can be really thoughtful writers and effective writers in digital space. So we're able to do that with this archive. 
Um, it's, it, it has taken 50 years to be able to do that, but now we can because we have this really rich differentiation across the archive. All right, um, so let's look at something else briefly. Um, and I want to kind of name what we're doing. So um, the research that I do is discourse analysis. And um, what discourse analysts do is they act sort of like discursive anthropologists. They look at the talk and text that we create, and they understand them to mean something about communities that write these artifacts. And it's really exciting to have that opportunity because you learn a lot about the people and the communities that write this work and what they value. Um, and certainly we can look at that more specifically by looking at metaphors, but there's a lot of, a lot of things we can, we can examine here. Um, so I'm going to focus on digital archives of letters that were distributed on various listservs. And listservs, um, they are digital space, but it's a very professor way to communicate. Um, does anybody belong to a listserv? Yeah, probably the faculty, right. OK, well, you actually, OK, and yes, and, and graduate students. Um, so uh, you probably are on listservs, but you may not participate in them. Um, but I want to encourage you, and I'll talk to you about what a listserv is, but I really want to encourage you to think about the space where you communicate most frequently in digital space and adapt some of what I'm talking about to those spaces, because um, what I'm going to talk about is not specific to a listserv. But a listserv is just an email that you send to a bunch of folks who have the same interest. So um, instead of sending an email to one person, I send it to potentially hundreds or thousands of people. Um, and they can respond or not. And whether or not they respond uh, tells you a lot about the initial artifact itself. Okay, So I'm going to look at some examples here. And here we're talking about computer-mediated mediated communication. And that is just writing in the clouds writing in digital space. And there's asynchronous computer-mediated communication. That's an email, right? I send it to you. And maybe you'll respond immediately, but you don't have to. It can sit there for a little bit, and then maybe you'll respond later. Synchronous computer-mediated communication is happening at the same time in a chat room um, or, or something like that. And you have this more natural, um, not natural, more, um, it's more like speaking, having a conversation. All right, so I want to look at just a few examples, and then I'm going to be excited to answer any questions you have about this. So this is an email. Uh, it's not formatted as an email anymore, but it is um, an email that I received um, at a former university where I used to work. And it is a crime alert. So probably you all, I know you all get crime alerts just like I do because you are on a listserv um, here at MTSU, and you have to get all of those same um, emails. So um, I'm going to show you this first one. And then I'm going to show you what you can do with data visualization when you um, have a digital archive. All right, so this is a reported crime, armed robbery off campus. The police are investigating a report of an armed robbery that occurred at approximately 1.30 AM, Monday, July 21, at 950 Railroad Street. The victim, a female student, reported that she was in her apartment when she was approached by three house guests. Two of the suspects produced handguns and demanded her belongings. The suspects fled, in the, air, fled the area in a vehicle. Suspect one, black male, approximately five feet, four inches tall, dark skinned with a high fade haircut. Suspect two, black male, lightly skinned, curly afro, wearing a black shirt and armed with a silver revolver. Suspect three, black male, dark skinned, armed with an unknown handgun. All right, so you probably, or hopefully you're already starting to ask some questions about this or note um, some things that are interesting about this email. But what, um, I'm gonna skip to showing you uh, what this whole archive looks like. Because I looked at this email with a couple collaborators. And we started to notice some trends as we were reading uh, more and more of them that we thought it's kind of a strange, a strange email. So we ended up looking at the entire archive over seven years. And we found that 72% of the campus crime releases refer to black or African American assailants. And one of my collaborators was um, uh, a black student, and he talked about the fact that every time he, we get one of these crime alerts, he felt really uncomfortable because they were so vague. I don't know if you noticed this. They're so vague that they could be anyone, any person of color. And so um, some students started writing, wearing t-shirts that said, I am a timely warning, um, because it just it had the effect of, um, because of how frequently we got them, 
um, of making students and faculty of color just feel really uncomfortable when it turns out that these um, crime alerts actually ended up being representative of sort of the same uh, people perpetrating, perpet perpetrating multiple crimes, but it was the same people, okay? Does that make sense? So um, the way that these emails functioned had an impact that they didn't intend. And we were able to see that by looking at the aggregate. The other thing was that they, um, all of the, most of the incidents happened at night, 76% of them. But they were always sent out in the morning. And so people started feeling kind of like, wow, is this happening all the time? And it gave this sort of always on feeling um, to potential crime on campus. Again, something that we can see when we look at this aggregate archive and we start looking not just at the individual artifact but how it becomes a collective and then you can do some really interesting analysis and find out how that might be meaningful all right so again that's what this um, this visualization demonstrates all right different archive different letter archive um, I looked at 10 years of um, emails about job postings for writing faculty and uh, I'm gonna read this one to you also probably not super exciting um, but this is an email I look, uh, kind of email that I look at a lot. Seeking a director to oversee the development of a strong, fully articulated writing center and a newly instituted campus-wide WAC program. The director will be positioned as a leader and an activist, working with university administrators to develop and support policy. She or he will have authority to chair and serve on committees, providing a liaison among academic, administrative, and supporting units on campus. The director will be working in the interest of all departments on campus. All right, so a job advertisement. Not super exciting, but when you look at 10 years of them, you find some really interesting things. So this is a word tree, so another kind of data visualization. Um, and I noticed in looking at all of these letters together that um, one of the primary responsibilities was to collaborate. And I'm sure you are all asked to collaborate all the time, right? Um, but what does collaborate mean? So you see it's really, really disparate. So whether or not you can actually read the, the different words, you can see that collaborate, even though it's mentioned a lot, and the way this is developed is um, the size of the word tells you how frequently it's found in the data set. Um, so this is all the time. And this, these small ones, um, not as frequently. But these are the two words that happen before collaborate and then the two words that happen after. Okay, so that's how that word tree um, works. But looking at this helps us understand that even though everybody's saying this is something that you have to do, you have to collaborate, they really mean very, very different things when they say collaborate. All right, another word that was used frequently there was team. And again, even if you can't see the words, you can already see team means lots and lots of different things for this position. This would be important if you're going to do some more analysis here to understand how we understand how we uh, what we mean when we say we want somebody to collaborate or to be part of a team. Um, so again, just looking at this relationship between the individual and the collective, if we can look back and forth and back and forth, we start to see some really interesting trends and some opportunities for analysis. All right, last but not least, um, when you are writing in digital space. Um, some things to kind of think about. So um, this is just a screenshot of a listserv that I'm a part of. And I want to draw your attention to a couple things. Um, first of all, this is the audience. So when you write a letter to somebody, right, you have it in the to line. If it's a listserv, it's just to these thousands of people, not to an indiv individual person. Um, the, um, when you look at, when you get a listserv, you can get it in this way that you have um, sort of a summary of what everybody has said in the day. And this is, per, I think, particularly interesting because it measures how much people are paying attention to the various things that are said. All right, so let me explain how this is written. Um, these are the three different emails that were titled for the particular day. And then you have a number, that's how many people responded. Um, and that number tells you the, the responsiveness of a particular email, of a particular letter, okay? And if there's lots of people who responded, there's lots of responsiveness and there's lots of uptake. And that's what we're usually looking for when we write. It means that somebody has taken up our idea, responded to it, 
and, um, and, and been interested enough to, to actually talk to you about whatever the interest is that you've um, brought up. Um, one of the other things that happens a lot, is anybody on Twitter? Will you raise your hand if you are on Twitter? So um, the, one of the things that I've been particularly interested in, um, and I'm happy to talk about this if anybody else is interested, um, are transitional threads. So it's a moment when a conversation changes. So this here, this um, number three, was the original email that everybody was responding to. And then somebody changed the title because they thought the whole conversation was changing. And they changed it again. So one and two, somebody decided, you know what, this is, this is not what we're talking about initially. So they changed the entire title. So this happens in Twitter when somebody adds a hashtag or the hashtag changes, like it starts as one thing and then it totally becomes something else. So there's usually um, a way of marking this in different um, computer-mediated communication platforms. Um, but this whole notion of responsive, responsiveness and uptake, I hope you um, think about for yourselves. So my conclusion. We are writing more than we ever have. We're making just as many mistakes as we always have, but they're new mistakes. And though we may have our heads in the clouds at times, and I'm sure, um, I don't know if you all have been accused of that, but I've, I've been accused of that. How might we filter and harness our understanding of these clouds and bring them down to earth. So I'm just gonna return to my dramatic slide for a moment. We started with drama, hopefully we'll end with some drama. Um, so the big piece that I hope you take away is this perspective that writing in the clouds allows for us to do. This notion of the relationship between microanalysis and macroanalysis, individual artifacts, just that one letter that you write to somebody, and then the letters that you write over your entire life. Right, the individual letter and the archive of the letters. And when we tack back and forth between those two perspectives, we have a really useful understanding of, um, of ourselves as rhetors, as writers, and we can better understand the collectives in which we're writing. So I challenge you to do that as you move forward, to really think about this relationship between the individual and the collective, um, and always, always have that sort of tension in mind. All right, I had some questions for y'all, but I'm more interested in your questions. So um, my, my challenge is to help us stay grounded, just sticking with my metaphor of clouds. How can we stay grounded when we are writing in the clouds in digital space um, so that we are writing in effective ways? All right, thank you very much. I would love to, to hear some of your questions, to talk about any of these um, archives if, um, if they're interesting to you. Any thoughts? Yes, please. So you kind of started off with this premise that today's sorts of communication, cloud communication, is <laughs> undervalued, that people think things about it that aren't true. Um, because that is kind of the, the cultural consciousness of what today's sorts of digital communication is, how do you suppose that we should respond to people who devalue it and also kind of teach ourselves not to think about it that way because we're in a society that speaks of it and kind of teaches us to devalue the sorts of communication we use. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Do you have an answer? Do you, do you have an answer to it? No? Okay. Because um, it, was, it was formulated so thoughtfully. Um, I think research, I think research is the answer to most things. I don't know if that's the right answer, but that's my answer. Um, to demonstrate that there are really interesting and important things happening in digital writing, um, but also to really allow for differentiation. So I text my husband every day when I'm going home, and it is not an important text. It's just like I write like letters. I write H H H, headed home, honey, um, and so which I guess is cute, but it's not it's not meaningful beyond that. And so um, and it's okay to have levels of complication of complexity. Um, in your writing, but just to be really thoughtful about switching gears. And, um, and as much as we can, I, I invite um, certainly students in my classes and in my research, I'm always trying to make the implicit explicit. So we make a lot of decisions in our writing every day. When I write a text message to my husband, it's very different than when I write an email to a colleague or when I write a, um, a journal article. So I'm always very conscious about switching gears. And so I would encourage you all to do that as well, to just be really rhetorically aware of who your audience is 
as, as much as you can know, right? Because often these audiences are much more complex than we give them credit for. So when we are aware of that complexity, hopefully it impacts the way that we, that we communicate. So I hope that answers it. Research, 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 research. Other questions? All right, please join me in thanking our speakers.